it now for game two of the Canada Cup best of three final. Clark at center against Novi. It's to Orr to Clark at center, and he backhands the puck into the corner where Holacek steers it to Mikhaj. I'm Dennis Potvin, joined by Bobby Clark, and we're uh, looking at the 1976 Canada Cup series. Bobby, uh, that was the third time Canada had had a series against uh, the world, I guess, in 72, a much acclaimed series against the Soviets. And then in 74, the World Hockey League had had a, uh, a similar series. But what were your feelings about this one in 1976? Well, I think for, for us that were in the NHL, this was the first Canada Cup. And this was the best team, in my opinion, that Canada has ever put out. Pretty good defense headed by Bobby Orr. Yeah, every, I mean, five Hall of Fame defensemen. And because the game has changed, maybe, but in the defense that played on that team, were all outstanding defensemen and offens offensive defensemen. They played both ends of the ice. Uh, you just don't see very many of those types of players and to have five of them on one team, I mean, you, you just about think you can't be beat. Flynn Flon, Manitoba, there he is. You had that intensity that, uh, that sort of spread through the dressing room. Did you feel that that was happening or I guess it was just part of your personality? You weren't thinking about it much, huh? I think on your own team, it was important. On a team like that, uh, and in that type of important series, I think the captain, it's an honor to be, of course, but I don't think you have any impact on players. Everybody was going to play good, and, and everybody was a great player. Well, you look at the pairings that you're talking about on defense, and I'm out there now with Guy Lapointe, and you saw Bob Yore playing with Serge Savard. Uh, you know, those... Well, complimenting one another. Yeah. I, I think. Did anybody kind of say anything about me being the only guy wearing a helmet? <laughs> Maybe you're the only guy with brains. <laughs> and 10 seconds remaining in the minor penalty. Potvin, a lead pass to Gila Flora, center to Gilbert Perro. The great thing about this tournament, Bobby, as you know, uh, I made that pass to Guy Lafleur and then off to Perot and in the net. Those are the wonderful assists, you know. <laughs> yeah. Pick up. I, know, I think I was one step in front of our net, deep in our zone, and you hand it off to a guy like that, and great, you get an assist. I mean, it was. I thought I thought Gilbert Perot. A lot of people always ask me who's who's the most dangerous player that you played against in terms of you know the ability to embarrass you. And most of the time, I would say it had to be Gilbert Pro in a one-on-one -on -one situation mm -hmm. in terms of a, a guy coming at you. I think he played at 220 pounds. Yeah. And, he, and a, you know, his skating ability. You had to uh, beat him in 1975 in the finals to win your second Stanley Cup. Yeah, I think you're right uh, from forwards uh, about Gilbert Pro. When we played them, we used McClish against him and... McClish was so good and such a great skater that he could he could nullify Perot. But but if Perot got any open ice and got one-on-one -on -one with you, you were in trouble. The idea was to try and keep him, uh, you know, not get him the puck. Yeah. Well, he loved to pick it up deep in his zone. I played against uh, maybe the greatest team, uh, junior hockey team ever, that Montreal Junior Canadian team. I think it was 1969 where they had Martin and they had Perot and they had Tardif and Hull and all of these guys all playing on the same junior team. And this guy, Perot, is not quite as big, but maybe very close to it, certainly in the 200-pound class when he was playing as a, a last-year junior. And it was a team that was uh, unstoppable. So here's Sittler, Ganey, and Lanny McDonald. I mean, how can you get a better line than that? Yeah. And at that time, I suppose these guys would be 25, 26 years old in the prime of their career. If that, uh, yeah. Lanny McDonald uh, came up same year I did, and I think I was 23. Now, what a lot of people don't know about uh, Bobby Orr in that series is that uh, he, he never practiced with us. 
I mean, his knees were so bloated. Uh, if you remember with the ice bags between periods, he'd, he'd just pull down the socks, you know, underneath his hockey pants, and he'd sit there and just put these big ice bags on the knees. In 1976, uh, Bobby had had all of the he'd had all of the injuries and all of the uh, surgeries on both knees. I think that uh, any man could possibly have and still skate. I remember one morning at the before a game on the morning skate, he was out there hopping around on one leg, and I said to him, Jesus, Bobby, get out of here. You don't need to be out here. But he wanted to be on the ice with his teammates, and mm. I thought that was that series was probably the gutsiest series I've ever seen a player play. He, he could hardly walk, and you know, and you couldn't practice or anything, and then he'd go on the ice, and he'd be twisting and turning and skating. You'd mm. think there's nothing wrong with him. I don't know how he did that. Well, I, I think he, you know, in a sense, he might have known that this was sort of the last stand because yeah. it was just after that, of course, that uh, he, he left Boston and went to Chicago and tried to end his career there. And I don't think he played very much after that. Uh, the no. knees just couldn't hold him up. Yeah, they're yeah. unfortunately the knees were gone. Yeah, I, I believe that you're, you're right. That yeah. was he knew it was over and he was going to go out on a high note, and he certainly they're did. Doing that, and they are creating near chances at least at this point. And we played three minutes and three seconds here in the opening period, and it's Canada one, Czechoslovakia nothing. Phil Esposito, shot. Esposito. And it's two to nothing for Canada. What did you play when you guys won in 74-75? You had an older defense, all right? Van Imp and Watson and Watson and Bladen and yeah. DuPont. DuPont, so you go to We had to bring up Larry Goodenough because Ashby lost his eye. The, in 72, we found out the Soviets were, as a team, just as good as we were, and even though they dominated early, once we got in, in game-playing conditions like they were in when they started, it was, it was an even series, and what we had going better than them was that we were Canadian and we could rise to occasion you know rise to levels that they hadn't had to and couldn't and I think that was the only difference in the team was you know we had the Canadian blood in us I felt that uh, I mean in agreeing with you I felt that the Canadian teams and uh, this is not in any way a knock on, on any other country but I mean as a Canadian team you could get unbelievable individual efforts you know, the emotions would rise, you know, and in that series, it could be your line, you know, or it could be the Montreal Canadian line and, you know, or Phil. Uh, so there could be, you, you didn't know where it was going to come from, but you had no doubt that it was coming. Yeah, it was one of those, I agree with you, one of those teams that no matter who you put out on the ice, you knew they were capable of being the best line or the best player and they were never going to hurt you. And I, I think, again, you go back to Bowman, uh, you know, you could say that team was so good, all you have to do is open the gate. But the reality is probably that's the hardest team to coach. Yeah, I mean, I'd never, I'd never seen Bobby Hull play, uh, never been on the same ice in his, as him. And he had gone to the World Hockey League by then. And, you know, there's Bobby Hull playing with Marcel Dion, you know. And you would think that here are two guys that spent their careers playing sort of an individual game, I guess, being set up, scoring goals, they're the main guys. But, you know, when uh, when I heard that song, We Are the Champions, what was that, in the uh, early 80s or yeah. something, I thought back to the, uh, uh, to the 1976 series and thinking about how everybody sort of checked their egos. Yeah. And uh, that was never a problem in that series. No, it never was, and... Uh... Most of the guys on that team, I think you'll agree, were pretty easy going, very competitive, uh, very easy to to like, and very easy to be teammates with. And when you get people like that, you hope they're successful. If, if they're the ones scoring the goal or, or doing the check, and you're happy for them. Mm. We worked hard. Remember, we showed mm -hmm. up at, was that August 1st we showed up? And we weren't in as good a shape as the Russians or maybe many of the European teams. I think maybe what was lost is that 
many of the European teams start their seasons yeah. in, in August. And so they were at least a couple of months ahead of us in training going into this series or any Canada Cup series that was played in September. But I remember running up at Mount Royal. I hated that. I mean, <laughs> Jerry Cheevers and Guy Lafleur and I <laughs> were sort of, <laughs> I don't know where you were in the pack, but I don't think you were up with Bobby, uh, Bob Ganey and Daryl no. Sittler who had the long <laughs> legs and were like. <laughs> and ran all the time. <laughs> and probably. ran all the time. We kind of trotted around in the back there and tried not to be noticed. The Europeans in those days are, are somewhat similar to what they do today, although they're, they're maybe more known up now, but they were always players who played better on their national team and better together than they were when they come over here and tried to play. You know, you'll see great players like Milan Novi and uh, Peter Stashny's dad and his, his uncle and those guys, but on those teams, they were so good. That, uh, and those Stashnys didn't come over, the Suns did, but uh, Novi came over, he was lousy over here. And that's still the same way, you know, you see a lot of Europeans who you don't even know and never see again that play so good for them in these tournaments. Boy, I tell you what, I mean, we, uh, we're both involved in the NHL today in the modern age, and I might want to do this interview with you uh, <laughs> in some other context because I got to tell you, my feeling has always been that, you know, the, the European player comes out of his system mm -hmm. and the Canadian player and maybe even the North American player comes out of his own creativity, you know, and, I, and you can't forget what Wayne Gretzky said about the game today and that uh, oftentimes not allowing players just go out and be creative. There's a system for everybody now on the ice and yeah. Well, partly the 90s and, and hockey in the NHL has been a real system. Maybe we've adopted too much of the Europeans. Yeah, the difference in that game right there and, and the game that's played today is that any time there's a turnover going either way, if if the we get the puck, we tried to score. Okay. We oh, went on the that's... attack right away. Welcome back to the Montreal uh, well, Dennis, you know, the difference what I see in in the way hockey was played in those days and, and the way it's played today is that whenever there's a turnover, the puck, the team that has the puck is going to try and do something offensively. They're going to try and score. They're going to go on the attack. And if they lose it, they go back on the defense. In, in today's game, there's too many people are just satisfied to just play defense, never go on the attack. Now, on that play, you got nailed in the backboards. Mm -hmm. Did you hear, do you remember hearing Billy Barber yelling for the pass, or was it just an automatic that you dumped it to the front of the net when you got to it in that position? Watch how you get taken yeah. out here. There you are in the middle of the screen. You take a look to your left, but you couldn't have seen Billy. He was far behind you. I doubt if it was a, a yell. We played together so much, I would know instinctively where he was probably, or else I'd, I had seen him maybe long before I got there, knew where he was hanging out. Mm -hmm. Here, Billy went right to the net, knowing that that's the only place you'd be putting the puck. I mean, that's not a, it's not a play that is highlighted a lot, but in our, in our minds, and that's what you want to tell the people, as we see again, Prime Minister Trudeau. And, we, uh, and, I think and if you Margaret, recall, oh, yeah. had a nice party for us, remember, at the end yeah. of the tournament, yeah. yeah. He was there in 72, the Prime Minister, when we landed in Montreal. Real nice guy. There's Holt shot. And Perilla kicks at him. Bubla, number 19. But that's, I think, a big difference is that plays are not always, in the offensive zone anyway, they don't seem to be initiated to get a shot on goal, the first get possession of the puck in the offensive zone. Well, in my view, when you're in the offensive zone, you're, you're in dangerous territory. You don't want to fool around with the puck too long. You want to get a play on goal and then follow it up if you can the idea of getting into the offensive zone, holding on to the puck, was something the, the European teams did a lot in 76, and I think helped us in a sense, you know, because we delayed the, you know, what we thought would be the inevitable, and that's a shot on goal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they never got their shots on goal. Nets, number 10, and Marcel Dion move in. Both teams are at full strength. The puck comes to center. Without trying to criticize the... The reason that has changed so much is is because of coaching, and I'm not criticizing them, but they they coach so much defense. The uh, if you watch practices and watch games now, this uh, 
cycling the puck in the corners. That if there is any time that you played defense, if you were in the other team's end and you had a two-goal lead or something, you might try and keep the puck in the corner to kill the clock a little bit. Yeah. But there's no such thing as cycling the puck in the corner. Why would you keep throwing it behind the goal line? <laughs> and now that's that's what they do. Bobby, that's because they made the goal line so big now. <laughs> 13 feet behind the net. I thought, uh, I'd hate to be a defenseman today. You get lost back there. <laughs> you lose the primary focus is yeah. that defenseman is supposed to generate the offense, you know, get that puck moving forward. And Peter Mahovlich. I think Peter Mahovlich was a guy who was really, really outstanding in 72 and, and the same in this series, but he was one of those big, easy-going guys who, when you played against him, he might laugh at you or tell you a joke or something, yeah. do something goofy on the ice. He never took the game serious enough to utilize all the ability he had. He did in these kind of series, but during the seasons and stuff, he was just a fun-loving guy. I tell you, he was as big as anybody in today's game. I think. I think yeah. he was six five, six, and five yeah. probably two thirty, two forty, and you know he yeah. could he could get around. Yeah. There's a stat scene right there. Do you remember him? Really competitive. P stat scene right there. And there was one of them who was kind of a dirty bugger too, but really good player. At uh, Gila Point, jamming up along the boards, the point comes in and hits Pozar quite hard. And then everybody follows in. Canada two and Czechoslovakia no score, and it's Gila point number five. How did you find uh, in the, the sort of a, you know the game within the game in the face-off circle? Were there a lot of adjustments for you when you had played against the Europeans? In uh, in those days, even in 72, 76, through those years, the Europeans never emphasized winning face-offs. The odd centerman was, the Russians had a guy named Maltsev who I ended up playing a lot against over the years who was good on them, but, but most of them didn't take it very serious. And of course, we took them very serious. And I think they learned that from us because as the years went on, they got better and better. Uh, out there for Team Canada, gets it back to war off the board, hits Ganey, and back comes the check. Ternick, number 34, 14, racing down in over the line. Ternick takes to the side, and it knocks off his gate. Now, Chernick again, must have been the father of a, a current or recently playing um, Chernick in the NHL, right? Yeah, could have been. for McDonald, knocked down by Pospisil, and it's Augusta to Chernick. Chernick is checked by Sittler, gets the puck again, or scoops it ahead with his glove, and it's Pospisil clearing it right back in. Serge Savar behind his own net, watched by Chernick, Gets it over to the far side. Novi had it momentarily. Runs into Savard, and they'll have a face-off again. It was extremely tight checking too. You know, it was it was a different type of checking. Back I think. John has gone 121 minutes and counting without allowing a goal. Of if you watch when guys guys take other guys out, they're always trying to get the puck off them. It's not just three or four guys running and hitting each other and keeping the puck on the boards. There you go. <laughs> Flyer hockey. Yeah, yeah, that's what we expected. <laughs> and guess who's right in the middle of it? The captain. <laughs> uh, it was a pretty competitive series, you know. <laughs> you guys are pretty competitive anytime. Now you're pretty dominant in those days in terms of the, uh, the intimidation factor in the early to mid-70s. We, yeah, we were a team that St. Louis had success that way, and then the Bruins after them, and then the Flyers after them. But I think once, once the Canadians went on their tear and won three or four cups, and the Islanders did it, it started to change. Uh, but it, when we, we we did it, it was workable, and it helped us win two Stanley Cups. Well, yeah, everybody did it their own way. I mean, Wayne Gretzky really credited you in many ways in terms of the first guy to use behind the net in your office. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember him saying that uh, he'd watch you play and thought that that was a pretty good idea, you know, get back there and see who yeah. comes after you and get the puck by him. And I remember trying to check you back there. And it was always uh, the problem in the game wasn't so much, you know, when you made your mind up. But if somebody like you made a guy like me, a defenseman, hesitate, that was death. 
I mean, that's that's what you wanted me to do, is to hesitate, and all of a sudden things opened up for you. Yeah. There's another consideration that Team Canada is going to have to keep in mind, and that is penalties. Uh, it's one thing to take. Uh, uh, we hear Gary Dornhofer talking about penalties, and the, the one thing here, he's highlighting me taking, a, you know, an unnecessary penalty, but looked to me like that was a... You know, I just needed to hit somebody, you know. It was, it was pretty high energy, right? I mean, it was yeah. – I felt pretty emotional before every one of those games and throughout. And the way I sort of approached it was that I needed to get hits. I mean, that was part of the game I played. The old line in the dressing room used to be try and get a hit or a shot on your first shift on the ice to yeah. make sure you get into the game. That's right. That's right. Here's Helenko. The name is yeah. well known. Yeah. And you know, a former coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins recently passed away in a tragic car accident. He came over and had a fairly successful career as a big, yeah. lanky, Phil Esposito type player. Yeah. yeah. And we got those players at the end of their careers. So in these series, they were awfully good players. But when they got over to the NHL, a lot of them were running down their careers. So we didn't see the best of them. But Olenka was certainly a, you know, one of the top players ever to come out of Czechoslovakia. Now, I mean, you take a look at the power play here by the Czechs, and there's nobody on the Czech team that has any time when the puck gets to him. No. I mean, we were moving real fast. You know, and tall, lanky uh, Robinson there on the ice, but everybody was very aggressive in penalty killing. We never took the position of a box, and I think that's what I liked about this hockey team. We were yeah. Yeah, everywhere we were going to be aggressive. And had we had yeah. a chance, we would have gone for the goal, even shorthanded. Oh, yeah. See? I mean, Larry stepping right up, forcing the play. I think the Europeans weren't ready for that. They were, of course, playing on a bigger ice surface. They tended to back off a lot. Yeah, they did. The defense tended to back off a lot, and then you sort of congregate in front of the net and just wait for, you know, loose puck. The forwards checking in those those days never turned and skated backwards through the mid zone. You know, maybe a little bit when you're killing a penalty, but now they set their defenses up and the forwards are all skating backwards through the mid zones. They're well, facing the play, but well, that's that doesn't, uh, we that's can, that that's that famous trap. And uh, yeah. you know, I, you talk about the the best team, Bobby. As your quotes, maybe that ever was put together representing the Stanley Cup, the uh, in the Canada Cup, and representing Canada. And in the same breath, you're saying half the guys were in their early 20s. In today's game, yeah. you've got a lot of guys who are in their 40s playing the game in the NHL. I never thought that would be possible to do effectively, but I think the trap allowed a lot of people to do that. Trap and expansion. Yeah, they for did. sure. The challenging game wasn't so much there, yeah. Well, oh, Bobby Hall. This is constant motion, this yeah. game. It's what makes you love hockey when it's very, very few whistles, it's just constantly players going. Well, you look at Bobby Hull. I mean, Bobby was, what, 34, 35 then? Yeah, he was running his career down he, at that he, time. Yeah, he took the shot on goal, and he was back at center ice before the Czechs could get the puck over yeah. center ice. I mean, you were talking earlier about guys forwards playing as well defensively as anybody. I, I kind of – it always boggles my mind when they say a guy like Mario Lemieux or, you know, Wayne Gretzky or somebody couldn't play defense. I mean, that's ridiculous. Any talented hockey player can play defense if, that's, if he has to. And this is a great example of it right here. Of course. The uh, defensive game is not a hard one to play. You just have to be committed. I'm talking know, as a yeah, forward now. You know? I understand. Sure. Yeah. I agree with you. Canada Cup 76 on CTV. Six minutes and 36 seconds remain. Big Esposito had some of the best games of his career. In 72 and 76. He loved the spotlight. Yes. And I think that was a big motivator for him, you know. He, remember the dressing room? He was always talkative. Yeah. He's... Well, you really, he had that big speech in 72, huh? What was that in Vancouver? Well, it wasn't. Uh, it was given to on television, and, and none of our players heard it until 
we read about it in the paper or seen it on TV the next day. He's an emotional, you know, an Italian guy, very emotional, but lots of fun to play with and yeah. good guy on your team. On the far side with Novi runs into Dennis Potvin. Puck is loose and finally cleared down the ice. Did you get a sweater at the end of this, uh, one, one of the Czech sweaters? Yes. Uh, remember, we used to exchange used jerseys. To exchange, yeah, and I don't know where it is or anything, and I don't remember whose it was. Those are becoming valuable now, Bobby. You might want to. <laughs> you might want to find it. Somebody will pay a lot of money for that jersey. Uh, Seventy-six Canada <laughs> Cup. <laughs> I know the general managers don't make much money these days, so I <laughs> thought I'd yeah. offer a little, a little tip there to put some cash in the old uh, yeah. bank account. <laughs> in over the line and drops it all the way back here. Key Lafleur and Pasquale fighting for possession. Puck goes loose. Peter Mahavlik knocks it in. Back to the goaltender, Zarilla. Vladimir Zarilla. Shifts were a lot longer, too. Yes. We played a lot longer, yeah. There's no doubt there, about there that. There were minute shifts in those days. Yeah. These are, uh, these players, so many on this team, like yourself and Ganey and Sittler and McDonald and all these guys, were just becoming prime, prime players in the NHL and, and really the, you and those those guys I mentioned dominated hockey for about 10 years after that. It, it's no wonder so many of us feel that through the late 70s and 80s was the best hockey that uh, that we ever had. But it's interesting that that's the team that was picked. A lot of young players, a lot of good legs, and there you're seeing obviously a couple of the veterans right there and Phil mm -hmm. and, and Bobby Hull, but even Peter Mahovlich I don't think was 30 years old at that point. No, I don't think so and, either. And uh, so you know, the average age, uh, you know, was quite young. Yeah, it would have been. Again, we can relate that probably to the to the change in game now that uh, you had to skate. You had to yeah. be able to skate then. And it's quite, I, I believe that's why players' uh, careers ended around 34, 35 in those days. It was straight up and down the ice all the time. Well, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to highlight some certain areas there. At least I'm going to mention them. But as a defenseman, we were constantly challenged one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Today's game, it never happens, you know, because the or, or the, the game in the 90s has been where, you know, the defenseman can stand up. you got a third man. You make it a left-wing lock or, or the real trap. And then the goaltender handles the puck if they dump it in. So, you know, you had your guys like Chelios and Scott Stevens who, you know, who have been playing for a long time. Obviously, they know the game. But uh, their body uh, at 40 was able to withstand most of the season games because of that. Yeah. And Zarilla stops that. Bob Ganey slaps at the puck. Can't get a good shot. Robinson tries. Zarilla takes it off the boards to Halupa. Halupa to Borjak. Back come Czechoslovakia. It's Lanny McDonald coming in as a forward. Taking a solid hit on the opposing defenseman. The Bob Ganey as Ovi Alberg picks him up for an infraction. This is Canada Cup 76. There was absolutely zero obstruction. For hooking at 16-15. Ganey's the current general manager of the Montreal Canadiens and won the Stanley Cup as a coach of the Dallas Stars, one of the all-time greats in hockey. You know, you. You were on the same team basically in Minnesota, right? I mean, at yeah, that I was point, a manager. And you were the manager just after leaving Philly there, and yeah. uh, Henny became your coach. And I guess that was his first year back from playing in Europe. He was a player coach in Europe. Bob Ganey. Uh, yeah, at a, at a level of about junior B hockey, he was in France, but ah. it was. He said it was a great year for him and his family, but he wanted to get back in the NHL. So. Borjak scoops it off into the corner, goes after it, watched by LaPointe, taken out of the play, Stashney behind the net, and his... Well, there's no question that in this series, it was a lot easier for us and that we didn't have any kind of transatlantic travel, you know, like uh, yeah. the 72 team had, and a lot of the stories we'd heard... We got away with a mm -hmm. penalty there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that was Billy Barber, stuck his foot out. <laughs> Barber's a Hall of Fame player. No, it was big uh, to be able to play in front of our own fans in every city and every game. 
I mean, I Certainly. can't I can't quite imagine what it was like to go in '72 to go to Russia and play that series of games. One minute, 18 seconds. And you know, and I can't even tell you. <laughs> you had to be there to know how it was. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> I don't know if I, it was. <laughs> now the food and uh, you know the, the sleeping arrangements and all that stuff. Uh, we all, were, all those things would have been a way worse had we lost. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty hard to complain about the food when you won. Yeah. On the blue line with Mikosh just clears it off the board. Orr is turned around. Possibly she'll get to the gain, and it's knocked down by Bobby Clark. Out to center, Clark with Barber just backhand. Now we were playing mostly three lines there. It looks like. Exactly one minute. And then yeah, and then uh, every now and then they rejected, uh, you know, an extra forward. So I guess there were ten forwards and six defensemen dressed. Mm. But I haven't seen a sixth defenseman. <laughs> I think I, I think even when Scotty was coaching the Canadians, he he always used a short bench and uh, had certain players he would get out at certain times in the game, but never had any problem with playing three or four defensemen or nine or ten forwards. Been notoriously unsuccessful on their power plays, not only against Team Canada, but also throughout the rest of this series. I mean, if you look back to the Montreal teams, they always talk about the big three on defense. But there was six defensemen on that team, you know. There were, yeah. Yeah, you know. It's... Could you ever keep three defensemen of that caliber on any one team today? No. No. If you had one, you'd be hanging on like dear life to keep them, yeah. but you'd never get three anymore. For him and Orr behind his own goal for Canada. Bobby Orr laps it down the ice. 13 seconds remaining in the penalty. To you know, the coaching staff, we talk about Scotty Bowman a lot, but there's also Al McNeil was there. And Bobby Crom. Bobby Crom. Sam Pollock and Keith Allen. Gee, there's a. Did you ever have a uh, one of those uh, private meetings with Sam Pollock during that tournament? No, I, I never did. But when the first year I went to the Olympics with the with Team Canada, the first time in the Olympics. Before we went, uh, Bob Ganey and myself sat down with Sam Pollock and uh, you know asked him about how he put some of his teams together and what he was thinking about. And he he said, "Really, that's that's your job." He says, "But you know what? Screw the rules. Do whatever you have to to win." <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, in Toronto before playing the Soviets in that game. I, you might remember. We're, uh, you know, we had our pregame lunch uh, at the hotel, and then everybody goes back for their uh, afternoon naps or just quiet time. And I get a call in my room, and uh, uh, basically I'm asked to go upstairs. And I was a little nervous. I thought maybe they were going to tell me that I wasn't dressing tonight. You know, you always had that that insecurity. But boy, did you ever have a lot of respect for authority? And you know, yeah. And uh, I walked in the room, and there's Scotty Bowman, and there's Sam Pollock. And it's the first time that I had been in the room at Sam Pollock. And they basically just gave me this kind of pep talk, you know, like how important the game was against the Russians tonight. I don't know exactly where we were in the standings at that point, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll never forget that. I mean, I walked out of there. I couldn't sleep a wink <laughs> afterwards. And I just wanted to chew on the hockey stick and get the game yeah. going. Yeah. Well, obviously... What they were thinking was if for us to beat the Russians, you're going to have to be a great player that night. Yeah. You know, they they were smart enough to to do that to a player that they knew was capable of it and just to make sure he was aware that that's what they needed from him. Well, it was certainly great because uh, it was sort of a, I felt very patriotic, too, in that series. It was my, it was my first time playing in an international tournament. Uh, I played one game as a junior against a Russian B or C team, but this was really my first experience. And uh, as, as you know, we, we got pretty riled up uh, in terms of, you know, Canada against Russia. It wasn't just one team against another. It was really the country we're representing. Yeah, and this was the first tournament for uh, pro players where, where they got to really see it, how good the Czechs were too. You know, previously right. it had been just Russians. Though. Yeah. Now you're seeing how good the Czechs were and the Finns and the Swedes. There's some awful good hockey players in this world, and they weren't all in the NHL. I think sometime earlier I had watched 
just before this, I had watched the Russians and the Czech play in the Olympics, or maybe it was a world championship, and boy, I thought they looked real nasty. You can imagine having uh, that many Hall of Fame and great players on one team, and many of them just 24, 25, 26 years old, and being coached by Bowman, who is the greatest coach of all time. That game better than they possibly can. Shots on goal, Canada holding a 9-8 edge. This is Canada Cup 76 on CTV. Heading into the final 10 minutes now of the third period with Canada leading Czechoslovakia 3-2. And the final 10 minutes of the third period underway. Or at center. Hit by the referee Dahlberg. Clears it off the boards into the corner. And the whistle goes. A reminder that the individual winners of the Toyota Salikas for the outstanding players on the teams will be announced at the completion of the best of three final series. Two additional Toyotas will be awarded to the top players on both Canada and Czechoslovakia. That'll be announced at the end of the series. Of course, other winners have included Matty Hagman of Finland, Robbie Petorik of the United States, Boria Salming of Sweden, and goaltender Vladislav Trepjak of the Soviet Union. Nine minutes and 44 seconds remain to be played here in the third period. Kozar behind his own goal, right in front of the net. Stachny had it momentarily, then lost it. Hull gives it to Orr. Or to Marcel Dion. Or Jack lost it. Peter Stachny will try. Hull takes it away from him and sets up Perot on the far side. He just slaps at it. It goes wide of the net. Or Jack behind the net hits Perot. And now Peter Stachny will try. Gets by Dion. Head to Pozar. Hull checks him. Slaps it off the boards. And here's Halupa trying to get it out. As Czechoslovakia hemmed in, they finally break away with Pozar. Ozar, watched by Bobby Orr. Stop. Gets the back again, intercepted by Bobby Hull. At center, Dion with Perot. And the pass didn't get over. Orr tries it again, but Perot is inside the blue line, thus the offside. Just prior to the 10 minute mark of the period, the Czechoslovakian team had a very, very close chance around Rogi Vachon. They seem to have a wide open net and it seemed to just go off wide, but I think that Vachon got his stick out and on the puck, something that he has done very, very often in this uh, championship, particularly when he's had breakaways against him. Shots on goal up to this point. Canada has outshot Czechoslovakia 26 to 17. In behind the Czechoslovakian goal, cleared up to Augusta at center. He couldn't get to it, then goes back to his own blue line, gives it to Pospisil, checked by Guy Lafleur. Here's Augusta, in over the line, going in with Ternik, a long shot, and that's wide of the Team Canada goal. Peter Mahavlich down the ice for Lafleur, racing after him. Mikosh going after him, takes a shot, juggled by Zarilla, but he holds on. And Phil Esposito there to give him a tap on the pads. Job well done. as if the Clark goal has really had a, a very positive impact on the general play of Team Canada. They, they seem to be in a kind of doldrums prior to that play. Uh, the momentum seemed to have been taken away from them. The Czechoslovakian team was very much on the upswing, and now the situation seems to be reversed, and the Team Canada with a 3-2 lead and only 8-19 to go, they seem to be very encouraged at the moment. Bobby Clark against Alinka for this faceoff. To the left of Zarilla. Now both are waved out, a little too anxious to get the face off underway before linesman Vladimir Schubert would drop it. A shot by Leach deflected wide and Keichel in the corner, checked by Bobby Clark and Yuri Hollick winds up. Hollick lead pass to Bubla. Alinka takes it in over the line. Watch by Savard, a shot in front, no one there. Keichel slaps at it, a weak shot taken by Orr ahead to Leach. Leach all alone. Shot and Zarilla stops that as Reggie Leach was set up by Bobby Orr. Holland inside his own blue line. Coming back for Czechoslovakia. Gives it to Halinka. Halinka right in front. That deflection goes wide. Back come Team Canada. Barber to Savard going in with Leach. Taken by Martinets. Vladimir Martinets behind his own goal. 
Coming back for Czechoslovakia. Watched by Daryl Sittler. Had it knocked off his stick. Lanny McDonald runs into Keichel. Still has the puck. At the side of the net to Sittler. Back to Ganey, his shot. And he sent that one low and wide. Another shot. And that's wide as well. Savard keeps it in. As Canada putting on the pressure. Keichel runs into McDonald. Sittler tries to get to it. And Bublin of Czechoslovakia circling around. Kept in by Ganey. Ganey's shot deflected and goes wide. Gets it behind the net to Sittler. Daryl Sittler for Canada. Checked by Keichel. And they finally hold it there for a whistle. Ten Team Canada really pressing here in the third period. I think that's what they were missing uh, in the second period. They they had the two goal lead. They tended to think that that might be enough. And given the way Vachon had played and the defense had played, it seemed as if it might be. But when you do sit back that way, you leave yourself very wide open. Here is the the play that Reggie Leach. Let go a very hard shot, but Zarilla came out well, blocked the angle well, and got it in the midsection. Race for the puck in the team Canada zone. Stashney and LaPointe. LaPointe's there first. Stashney goes after it. They fight for it. Taken now by Bobby Hall. Hall for Canada. Circles back in behind his own net. Both teams are at full strength. Six minutes and 33 seconds remain in the third period. Stashney. Going in with Peter Stashner. Takes it into the corner. Watched by Potvan and taken out of the play. The point is checked. Stashney covers him up and they hold it there for a face-off in the Team Canada corner. And this will be to the left of Rogi Vashon as Team Canada now to decides to have a wholesale change. Peter Mohavlich, Esposito on the floor with Savard and Bobby Orr. Six minutes and 20 seconds remain in the third period. And of course, if it's tied, it'll go into sudden death overtime. Canada three and Czechoslovakia two. Stashny, that's Peter Stashny, number 26, waved out of the circle. And Marion Stashny will take the face off, number 18, against Phil Esposito. Esposito wins the draw. Goes to Peter Mohavlich. He just clears it down the ice. And Vorjak going back for it. Watched by Esposito. Goes behind his own goal. In front of Peter Stashny. Over on the far side. Marion Stashny in over the line. Gets a shot. Knocked down. Vorjak goes in after it or checks him. The floor is turned around. Peter Stashny gets it. Checked by Mohavlich. Mohavlich races in. Takes the pass. And circles around. Here's Esposito with shot. Several key stops, especially here in the third period. So realize the the kind of goaltender. Here's the the play. The one thing that uh, Bowman has always been given credit for, and and rightfully so, is being able to get the right people out at the right time. And, and I think through this that series, you you found that out. You, if we needed a goal, he had the right people out there that always seemed to get it. He'd have the right defense pairings out, and, and I, I think that's a. Uh, Probably what one of the great things that separates him from other coaches. You can imagine having uh, that many Hall of Fame and great players on one team, and many of them just 24, 25, 26 years old, and being coached by Bowman, who is the greatest coach of all time. And, and I do think people like Arbor and Shiro and those guys, had they coached as long and won as many games, would be considered the same as Bowman, but, but Bowman certainly deserves to be the considered the greatest coach of all time you know talking about Bowman I always felt when I played for him and you heard a lot of things about him I never actually played during the year but he was the kind of guy that no player no matter how great the player was he didn't get a sense that he was intimidating Scotty Bowman Scotty was going to do his job was going to get you to do your job Well, I asked Bob Ganey once what what separated Scotty from other coaches. He said, Scotty's opinion always was, if you can't help me win, I don't want you. <laughs> and it didn't matter, he said, if you were a player or a trainer or whomever. <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling the story about Scotty. We're in Winnipeg playing against a Russian team. But I remember, <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. 
we were in Winnipeg, and Scotty was trying to tell us about this Russian team. And, of course, he had all these, you know, uh, you know, Karlamov and all that, but he got very tired of using the Russian names, and he and he went on to say, "This guy you got to watch, and that guy you got to look after." And that. <laughs> I, thought, I felt the same way. I didn't want to mention those names anymore. The tongue twisters. Yeah. And when you watch this and and you go through, you'll see that when the team was chosen. Uh, there was the line I had in Philadelphia with Barber and Leach were there, and you had Sittler, McDonald, and they added Bob Gainey, and the Canadians had Shut Lafleur, who played together all the time, and Mahovlich in the middle, and then you had Dion and Gilbert Perot and all these guys. I mean, it was an unbelievable hockey team. Czechoslovakia goal scorers tonight, Kozar and Novi. And the Czechoslovakian coach, Dr. Bjorn Starshi, looking on. Great concern with four minutes and 40 seconds remaining. Back to Bobby Hull. Hull gives it to Orr, his shot. Stop the rebound. And Zarilla stops that. Back comes Keichel. Keichel a long pass to Martinez. In over the line. Checked by Savard. Takes it in front. And a good poke check there by Vashon. Checked by Martinez. Peter Stashnik. Martinez at center. Runs into Dion. Has the puck. And fires it into the Team Canada corner. Vashon leaves it for Orr. Hall on the far side. He runs into Bubla. Check. Here's Peter Stashnik. Shot hits Orr. Another shot. Scores! And Bobby Orr is hurt. Slovakia takes the lead. That first shot hit Orr, and he got up slowly, but he appears to be all right. Just a great play on the boards there by, I think it was Bubla, who was checked out of the play, but had the presence of mind to stick his stick out. And the Team Canada player trying to get by, had the, the puck bounce off his stick, out in front, a series of shots, and the goal. A perfect shot right in off the post. A very excellent play by the Czechoslovakian player along the boards. He had no right to to be uh, to have the ability to make that play because he seemed to be effectively taken out of the play. That goal scored at the 16-minute mark of the third period. Pospisil shield and Obi, his shot, the rebound in front. And Chernik almost got that one home. Here comes Esposito into the corner. Gail of Florida, Augusta going after it. Augusta slaps at it. Potman tries to get it out. Esposito runs into Pospisil. shield. Now things are opening up a little bit in this game. This was the... Uh, the final game, the championship game. Here in the third period, Czechoslovakia. Yeah, and 4-3, but everybody's involved now, and I think both sides are, are trying to their hardest to win and just going for it. It's like the four-on-four four in overtime now. <laughs> wonder how many Bruin fans ever saw Phil Esposito in the corner checking a defenseman. And that's that's exactly what's happening. Guys doing anything they could. Augusta and Sittler taken to Novi. Novi just dumps it out to center. There I am pinching in. L. Arbor's yelling. Yeah, I know. The point back up to center ice. Three minutes remaining in the third period. The point was one of the great defensemen in the NHL who is. Always a little overshadowed by Savard and Robinson, yeah. but certainly is a Hall of Fame defenseman. Esposito. Esposito. Watched by Posty Shield. Check. And it goes out where Orr's back on the ice. Sitler. He's checked and knocked down by Posty Shield. Mikos tries to get it out. Hits referee Dahlberg. Ivan Holinka. Down the left wing side. In over the line. Takes it to the corner. A shot. Loved by Vashon. Wow. Right there. I mean, I would have thought Vashon would have stopped the play, but again, it seemed to be the mentality of that game, you know. Let's keep the play going so we could get the goal. Yeah. We were behind at that point. Clark just dumps it into the corner, leads in after it. Leads behind the goal and plays it. Ha 
Again, you know, this is the kind of play you were talking about earlier. I mean, Leach went to the corner, and it's just basically a blind pass to the front of the net, but obviously not blind. He knew by instinct that just by you instinct, were both going to be there. Was and, yeah. yeah. When you play together for a long time, uh, and that again doesn't happen in today's game, but we were together for seven or eight years. Yeah. You know where your line mate is all the time. You know where he's going all the time. Uh, you look at both of you going there, Barber and uh, and yourself, and that puck was uh, was going towards that net one way or another. And went to the right guy. Billy could really score. Yeah, he could, could he? Played junior against him when we's, he was in Kitchener and. You know, you can just tell when you're on the ice with some guys, you know, they have it's not so much their their ability or their talent. It's their makeup, you know, as an individual that he's not going to be denied, you know, the the path that he wants to take in the game. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Pretty nice guy okay? after your goal coming back with the Montreal yeah. Canadiens line of shut and Lafleur. Look at him flying. Oh, that's, yeah. Look at LaFleur checking it. Look at that. Down the ice, Robinson checks him. And Czechoslovakia will be called for Iser. A 4 4 tie. What a great player LaFleur was. No, well, he was five or six times scoring champion in the 70s. That's when that team was unbelievable. The Montreal Canadiens, just after your reign, uh, Steve Shutt, obviously. Yeah. Toronto native, played against him when he was with the Toronto Marlies. And tough player. Lafleur was an elegant player. That, yeah. That because of the way he played and his stature in the game and stuff, players didn't really want to hit him very hard. You had no. too much respect for him, and, and he didn't hit you either. So. Well, you know, players like that, it's not all that often. I mean, I know I tried to hit most of them, but mm. that you could find him in one of those uncompromising positions. Uh, he was not the puck carrier, first of all. It had to be Lemaire or, you know, there's always a guy who sets him up. A little like Bossy, you know, the Eric Curry. Even Gretzky was probably the best at it that I've ever seen in terms of always being four feet away. You know, once you got that step, you thought you could hit him, the puck's off. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that play by LaPointe. Oh, that, that happens, is eh? outstanding. <laughs> I mean, just the tap on the shaft of the stick did it. I think Jill Perot thanked him after that. <laughs> <laughs> That is an incredible play by Guy Lapointe. I'd forgotten about that play. I mean, I'm on the other side trying yeah. to get back. <laughs> you are praying. Watch this. Unbelievable. But he still got the shot away or semblance of a shot, and Rogie was there with the right pad. That really is a special play when you consider all the thoughts that go through your mind in a situation like that, particularly in a pressure situation, for LaPointe to keep his focus on Novi's stick. As soon yeah. as Novi brought the stick back to his forehand, he had a chance there to, yeah. to tap it. That's, like I say, that's a Hall of Fame move right there. He's checked. Clark at center ice just scoops it into the corner. Gorilla out of the net. Watch by Leach. Taken now by Yuri Holick. He tries to get it out. Gets it to center with 25 seconds left. I think Yuri Holick is Bobby Holick's dad. By Barber. In behind the net. Clears it to center. Savard. That uh, Czechoslovakian team produced a lot of NHL players. They sure did. Their sons. With 10 seconds left. Keichel to Holick. Six seconds. Over the line. Halinka. Third period is over as we head into 
overtime. Too many, many anxious moments there, Ken. Incredible. There are so many scoring chances there at the end from a very carefully played hockey game to absolute chaos at the end where it seemed like the last shot was going to win. I would expect that the two coaches will try to get a, a grasp uh, onto their respective teams uh, in this particular intermission and try to get them to play a little bit more controlled hockey, knowing that this next goal is absolutely critical. Well, talk about key goaltending. End to end, they had some great stops there in that third period as Canada outshot Czechoslovakia 14 to 7. Novi almost putting it away for Czechoslovakia. He was hooked from behind, as we saw in the highlight on the replay. He got a weak shot away, but Bastian made the stop as well. So far in the game, Canada has outshot Czechoslovakia 34 to 21. It's a 4 4 tie, and we'll be back with overtime following the intermission with. Al McCann and Tom Watt. This is Canada Cup 76 on CTV. Sudden death overtime is underway. Here's Bobby Clark in over the Czechoslovakian line to lead top five. Well, that was a pretty, uh, pretty strong statement, Bobby, by uh, Scotty Bowman. Your line started that game, and uh, there you are again starting the overtime. Yeah, Scotty has said, and uh, I don't know if I agree with him or not, but he thought that the three of us were the best line for three or four years in the NHL. Um, I don't think a, a, a line can be the best line for a long time but for a while he thought we were the best line well it involves having all the components you know having the strength and the speed and the ability to score and yeah yeah so you sure you certainly had that the third period Augusto gets by or takes it into the corner right in front and Cherna couldn't get a stick on that Barber to Red Leach Leach gets to the line check Barber carries on Chernick takes the puck from him and Savard has it at center ice. Off the boards to Leach. Back to Savard to Peter. Boy, one of Savard's great moves is when he, he'd show you his back and he'd protect the puck like yeah. he did at center ice. He could never get the puck off him. No, Serge was so mobile for such a huge man, and he'd stick his big rear end out. You'd need a taxi to get around him. You know, we talk about injuries to Bobby Orr, but Serge Savard right there, they're playing together. Serge had a very serious uh, leg injury in his last few years in Montreal, and that pretty much, uh, you know, ended his career. He ended. He, he went to Winnipeg for a year or so afterwards. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Serge recently, and he reminded me that when he went to Winnipeg, that was when uh, Dale Howardchuck first came on on the scene. That's right. And he said he... Well, well Serge, I think he'd had those ankle injuries early, broken two or three times and had retired. Yeah. And then and then came back. That's right. But in those days, putting a pin in your leg was no uh, no easy thing. You know, the surgeries then were... Of course, I'm looking at John D'Amico there who's going to do the face-off. Just losing John, unfortunately, recently. Behind his own goal. Checked by Gail Fleur. And he falls on the puck. Checked by Guy Lafleur. <laughs> Yuri, Yuri Bubla was a defenseman in Vancouver for a long time. Yeah. His son played in the NHL. Played in Boston last year. To a certain extent and not take any kind of chances. However, given the way the latter part of the game went, one can never tell. Michael, number 17, goes behind his own goal for Czechoslovakia. Comes right in front. Up to his own blue line. Watched by Peter Mahovlich. Mahovlich checks him. Boy. I mean, it's, it's that not indicative of the way Mahovlich is checking. Here comes shut. We're just hungry for the goal. you got to be aggressive in those situations. Yeah. I mean, we, wanted, we really wanted to win this game, obviously. That's the, the tournament hung on this. Overtime. Two minutes in overtime. Shut. Long shot. And it's offside as it hits Bubla, though. But it was offside as the Team Canada player was over on the right wing. I think we carried the play the whole game, but any small breakdown the Czechs took advantage of. Yeah, they sure which, did. Which yeah. obviously shows the skill of that team they have. Yeah. 
You know, another uh, we talk about the coaching staff, and you know, Al McNeil was there, and we saw Bobby Cron behind the bench. But obviously, Scotty Bowman was the uh, the chief architect. Long fakes the shot, though. There's another shot, and that goes wide of the net. Halupa races in, puts it right onto the stick of Larry Robinson, and it's cleared to center ice. Orjak just slaps it into the corner again. Robinson takes it off the board. See, they're not forechecking much. You know, you notice here, maybe they were in a line change, but, you know, the whole game, they were pretty tight on top, and here they yeah. seem to be playing a little more of a defensive game than we were. Like you say, they're just waiting for that one opening, waiting that for turnover. A mistake, yeah. yeah, one little mistake. There's Rogi Vashon in goal for Team Canada. You, even though the wingers stayed predominantly on their side and the centerman in the middle, they, there's a lot of swinging. Players make the sharp turn and keep going all the time. It's not going to an area and stopping. Players stay in motion. If a third game is needed in this best of three final, it'll be played Friday night here at the Montreal Forum. Mikhaj gets the shot. Now this is the, the second of a possible three game series. Yeah. So that was an interesting Marcel Dion took the face off and Sittler's on the ice. Hmm. One could normally expect that uh, at this stage. Uh, Marcel must have been having a good night because Sittler is an outstanding face off man. Given the fact that it is uh, in a potentially deciding game and it is in overtime, both teams... A little play going on right here, I guess. Uh, Scotty uh, trying to match lines, maybe. Here you come on for that defensive zone face-off. That's, that was basically the easy call to get you out there to win that draw. Sudden death overtime. The puck is dropped. Or at least tie it. Yeah. That's defensive zone. It's the biggest thing is just make sure the other guy doesn't win. The point slaps at it, kept in by Pospisil in front of the net. Stashny or Chernik gets a shot at it. Novi goes in to help out. Comes back to Augusta to Chernik. He fans on the shot. Mikosh clears it in. Hot fan back for Canada. Hot fan going in with Bobby Clark and Barber. Lost his stick. Nope. Got to have the stick. Yeah. Runs into Mikosh and now Augusta. For Czechoslovakia. At his own line. Novi. Chernik. Runs into Bill Barber. Novi backhands it in over the Team Canada line. Esposito. Long pass for Leach. Leach breaking in on goal. Takes it behind the net in front. Oh, and Barber fanned on his shot. That was a great play by the goaltender. Julia was that goaltender. He was their second, uh, well, you don't want to say second string goaltender, but I don't think he was uh, slated to be their number one goaltender in this tournament. But that was an excellent play. Watch how he kicks the puck out of the way. I think he does. Yeah, I think he does. He gets a stick or a blade on it, and Bill Barber is all alone there. Never really got a shot. Sudden death overtime. Canada and Czechoslovakia. Just close. Mm. But Leach made a real good play. So did Esposito come and entering the zone. Again, you know, we mention it so often, but you look at that team, and it didn't matter where the puck was. Whoever was close to it went and made the play. I mean, there's Leach in the corner making the pass, you know, fighting off the guy. And, you know, sometimes people would think that Leach was the guy who'd stand in front of the net and wait for you to get him the puck. But especially in a series like this, this is a Stanley Cup series for everybody. Yeah, Leach loved to score. Even in practice, he would spend all his time trying to score. And the other parts of the game... He could do as well as he wanted to, but they weren't just as important as scoring. But when you got him in a series like this, got him in the playoffs in the NHL and stuff, he could have killed penalties, done anything, although they didn't use him killing penalties because he could skate and he's big and strong and had real good knowledge of the game. Well, he also played with one one or two fewer people in the, in the lineup back then. Yeah. So you want to make sure your guys are fresh. Chance for Halinka runs into war, and we have another faceoff. Very dangerous play around the Team Canada net, not unlike the play. The other now Bobby had a great tournament that year, and was rewarded with most valuable player. And you know, we talked about all of the knee injuries and everything, but when you watch him on this play, you see he's not concerned about getting the puck for himself, but he's got a player very well positioned behind him, and then 
You know, he's he's looking to get to the puck, and he finally fought Halinka, a much bigger man, to put a stoppage to the play. You know, it's it's fun to watch the great players doing whatever it takes. It's interesting when you look back how many great, great defensemen and after and during yours, but after Savard and some of these guys left, you know, you had a, a Raymond Bork and Al McGinnis and these guys that were just dominant players. And now we're, we're keeping our defensemen so defensive that they, they, they don't have much chance to become top offensive players like this era produced. Mm, that's right. And also, you know, Norris Trophy winners in the 70s and 80s were 25 years old. Young. Yeah. Had he scored in that game, <laughs> it would have been, it would have been wild. Of course, that game played in the Montreal Forum. Pass on the right side. Pozar, I really blew that one. I, that is Peter and Marion Stashney when I played against Peter's dad and uncle was in '72. There you we, go. we played in Czechoslovakia after uh, the Russian series. We played two games and they were on that team, but Peter must have been young then. Well, as we watch in the older time, I'm gonna. Give you a little scoop on what I remember hearing in between uh, the third period and the overtime. The coaching staff and Scotty Bowman had told us a little something about the goaltender that if you come in wide on him, you know, he might sort of shift a little and get himself right out of the net, you know. Right. And we saw Daryl Sittler right there just take a weak shot to the far side of the post. On that particular shot, he missed the net. Leans too far, eh? Yeah. So he can't cover the back. Yeah, side. you'll see it here again Doesn't on the replay. Sutter, Siddler gets it and he's looking, looking. Then he just misses the net wide. That would pay off for him a little later. That, that little note we got in between periods. Novi gets set for the draw for Czechoslovakia. Clark wins it. Novi goes after the puck. Leach scoops it in and it's cleared to center ice. Larry Robinson. Off the board, in behind the Czechoslovakia net, Costa Shield. In front, and Leach intercepted that. It's clear down the ice, and it's icing against Czechoslovakia. Did you find it a tough time of year to get geared up? <clears throat> no, you know what? I, I hear all those things when there's summer tournaments and stuff. You know what it's like when you're playing hockey? You want to play hockey anytime. Yeah. It's not, uh, it wasn't like we were doing Team Canada a favor. We were grateful they asked us. That's right. We certainly weren't given a lot of money. It was never for that, <laughs> as you well know. ...portion of the game, the three periods, but they've iced the puck three times so far in overtime. Obviously not taking any chances. Bobby Orr off the boards behind the net. Leach after it. Leach has stopped the pass in front of this puck. Oh, that was going in, it looked like. just before the You know, a lot of rules have changed in the game today, and one of them is the length of the hockey sticks. The hockey sticks could not be any longer than 55 inches from the heel to the top of the shaft. Do you remember one day in the dressing room you were checking my hockey stick? <laughs> you used an illegal stick, eh? <laughs> well, just so people know what the story is about. Later on in, during the season, we are playing in Philadelphia, and I had been using an illegal stick. It was about 57 inches. Yeah. And uh, Bobby picked it up during practice and obviously figured it out. <laughs> and you thought you were going to keep it to yourself. <laughs> and then a game in Philadelphia later that, I guess it was a one-goal game late in the period. You wanted us to get a penalty. <laughs> but I had... I had already been practicing all week with a 55-inch <laughs> stick because I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> oh, talk about competitiveness. It didn't stop. There's the turnover That's on our end, good, eh? Oh, yeah. What a save that was. 
Now, those are the kinds of saves that he was making all through the tournament. Yeah. Ovation's almost the order of the day for Ogi Vashon as he gets another one. Esposito out to center for Canada. Had it knocked off his stick. Guy Lapointe inside his own blue line. Watched by Martinez. Gives it to Hull. Hull runs into Bubla. And Guy Lapointe carries on over to Perot. Hollick has him tied up. In behind the net, Esposito and Hollick. Halink well, you know, they talk about support. All the time, you know, support the puck, you know, the common mm -hmm. common verse in, uh, in today's game. You look at guys who essentially didn't know each other very well, not having played a lot on the same team in most cases. You know, tremendous puck support. And Perot couldn't reach it. Michael has him tied up. Pollock. This has to do with everybody hungry to get it. Perot will try now. Perot has turned around. We played. Well, it's, here in it's always been said that the Canadians need less time to prepare for a tournament than any team because the other teams play so much system, we play so much uh, instinct and, and just go. Right. And when you get into tough games, the Canadians are still going. And the other teams have to practice a lot more to get in their systems, and if you disrupt their systems, you can disrupt their team, obviously. That was off. That would have been penalty I mean, shot. That would have been the overtime game-winning goal right there. And in Montreal Forum, Guy Lafleur, <laughs> you can just imagine. That's an equation that would have been outstanding. He wasn't God in Montreal, but he could shake hands with God. Lafleur, <laughs> here's here's Bobby Hull. Denny Pons, Dennis. Yeah. Takes the shot. I mean, he had Bobby Hull wide open, too. Yeah. Now watch Halinka go in. His momentum takes him into the net. Whoops. No video replays in those <laughs> game, I guess. He didn't have the, the uh, angles that yeah. uh, you have today, but very, very difficult uh, that was a tough call to make. A gutsy call, really. Great play by Potvin. Yeah, it was. Watch the puck right behind, squirting out, but the puck was definitely off the moorings before the, the puck entered the net. Now, this is a, a final series in 76 where it was a three-game series to see who would win the tournament. And uh, we had won the first game. And this, of course, uh, would have been the tournament-winning goal. However, the Czechs are, are obviously willing to give up a penalty for the sake of a goal. We played eight minutes. And you see Bobby Orr today, he still looks young enough to play. I know. He's the yeah. only one of us who never got old. <laughs> <laughs> His life must be a lot easier. He's a player <laughs> rep. Yeah. <laughs> that is dislodged intentionally. International hockey, it's a minor penalty, and that's what will happen here with Czechoslovakia serving a two-minute penalty at eight minutes, 30 seconds of sudden death overtime. That is a, a play that is almost never seen. Uh, I'm sure I've never seen it before uh, in my life, and uh, I imagine the next time will be some years hence as well. A really remarkable. You know, you talk about the Stastny's. They, they had. They must have had a pretty young team as well then. Of course, in those days we didn't know any of the checks. We didn't know. That's what we said right off the uh, right off the top. But we didn't know any of the players on any other teams: Russians, Swedes, Finns. I mean, in 1976, you could really count on one hand the European players that were in the game, and they were mostly Swedish. Yes. They were like the first ones to come over. Yeah, there had been a few that uh, went, I guess Winnipeg had a few very good ones, Hedberg and Nielsen, yeah, that in was the later, World Hockey. That was later that was in, in the, the 70s, hockey, too. Yeah. yeah, They didn't come in the NHL until 1978, and they're joining the Rangers. Was, yeah. But uh, you all Whiting, remember that name? Yeah. Played out in Los Angeles. So Played junior in Brandon. So then he wasn't really a European coming over. Yeah, I think he come over when he was about 15 or 16. Uh, he was a, I played junior against him. He was, a, he was a real good junior player. So it wasn't until the late 70s then that uh, he really had some European players who were prepped and ready and drafted and came over and played in, in North America. So I know we had a couple of great ones on our uh, Stanley Cup teams in the 80s. Yeah. Stefan Pearson and Thomas Janssen and Anders Kalur. Hold it against the boards for a face-off, and we used up 20 seconds. 
of that penalty. Bobby Clark has been injured. Uh, he's being taken to the dressing room, limping. I found that most of the European players were very strong. And they were really strong on their skates. Very strong. Never off their feet. Their, uh, yeah. their leg strength was tremendous. And a lot of those guys, we talk about, you know, the, a lot of the, the sons and the fathers mm. have played. And, and I think they have, if I remember, in talking to many of the Czech players over the past few years, you know, the way it was back then and still is today is they have these leagues, you know. They have these, you, you, you join a club team right. in your town in Czechoslovakia and you start at nine years old and you'll play with the same guys all the way through. and For the club. Yeah. Yeah. So you learn the system, you play the system, and you play Czech hockey or Finnish hockey or, right, or yeah. Swedish hockey. Bobby Orr behind his own goal to Esposito. Great way to keep tradition and history going, eh? Yeah. Kids following their fathers. And we have 44 seconds remaining in the first 10 minutes of sudden Oops. death overtime. Hmm. Now, what, what do you think happened there? Uh, Phil should have got off the ice. He's playing with your wingers. There he is, sitting down at the end next to Gay LaFleur, as usual with Bobby. No, I think Phil replaced me there. I twisted my ankle or something, so Phil played between Barber and Leach. Oh, that's right. There you are. That's an Esposito. Gets set for the draw. Back to LaPointe. And LaPointe has it at center ice for Canada to Bobby Orr. 38 seconds remain in the first 10 minutes. Only hurts for a little while, right? Mm-hmm. Are you hurt or are you injured? If you're hurt, you go play. <laughs> up over the glass and out of play with 27 seconds remaining and they'll switch ends at the midway point of this sudden death period now I'd heard that Reggie Leach had a shorter blade did he said I had a short blade Reg, uh, Reggie Leach used a, a stick that I could take from the dressing room and give it to my seven or eight year old son it was so small and the, the blade was about half as big as the one I used. I mean, I don't know how you could play with it. It was short. But, and, and nobody could shoot the puck better than him, and nobody's right. more accurate either. That's right. I mean, I think he shot it as hard as Bobby Hull and was more accurate than Hull, I believe. And his release was a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I always like, remember. Bobby it. could shoot rockets, but you got to remember that, like... you got to give him 25 feet. And they used a huge curve in the... Yeah. In the so. And a big blade. But, yeah. Interesting about the Bobby Hull uh, curve. I don't know if you know this, but Bobby was telling me. Actually, the guy who told me was Stan Mikita. Apparently, they were playing together in practice in Chicago, and they had the pretty, you know, the straight blade like everybody else used. And uh, Bobby, during the course of the practice, broke the blade of his uh, hockey stick right in the middle of the blade. Mm -hmm. And so he just decided to keep playing with it rather than wait for the trainer to get another stick. And he took a couple of shots, and the thing went wild. <laughs> and they thought, this is something. So then they went right back to the dressing room, he and Nikita, and started using the torch. Sure. The light did not go on. No goal again. Wonder what happened there. Ah. As is the case, if that red light, the red light cannot go on once the period has ended. And that is yeah, that, that was a different rule than what... Uh, it changed ends after ap 10 minutes. Yeah, we didn't do that over here. All right. The red light, which signifies the goal... And the yeah, we changed end after 10 minutes in the overtime. ...are such that the two of them cannot go on at the same time. The puck went into the net. The goal judge tried to flip the... Yeah, the green light will go on automatically, and it should block the red light from going on. So you're getting the explanation there. Yeah. It is technically supposed to be a foolproof system. However, what is... You weren't arguing. Yeah, I, I don't know why we ever would argue, but we always did. They weren't going to change the, what they were doing. The Gila Point just drifting yeah. a shot right through. Yeah. And the goal is disallowed, the end of the first 10 minutes. And that goes back to Monday night with that goal scored in that game. But it was scored just in time. The red light came on. Ken will recall that. But here, it just the complete opposite. The red light couldn't go on because the period... Now, that's two goals that the, we had scored. <laughs> we, we think it's 6-4 Canada. The Czechs still think it's 4-4. Four -four. Yeah. From the point, it goes through a number of legs. It appears that Zarilla has it for a while, perhaps long enough for the period to end before it trickles behind. There you can see the light on, and it is definitely the blue light rather than the red light. 
So we head into the final 10 minutes of the first sudden death overtime period. And it's a 4-4 tie. Canada 4, Czechoslovakia 4. How's Dornhoff for your old teammate doing the commentary and in the booth? Yeah, played on a couple. Cup winners was hurt in the first one, but major contributor in the second one. Be scored and counted, both disallowed. 25 seconds remaining. Was he ever? He scored a big goal against us in that seventh game. Yeah. Early in the game. Uh, we still felt that if we could have won that game, we might have won it all. <laughs> yeah. Third year team. Yeah. Of course, we're referring to the 1975 Stanley Cup semifinals. The Flyers beat the Islanders in seven games. Kate Smith. Yeah. I don't know if Augusta ever come over here. I don't recall, but he was really a terrific player on that team, too. You know, we had the Islanders had a goaltender named Augusta, but I thought he I think he was more he was mm -hmm. probably Swedish. Came over for right. a while. You know, you'd, I'm sure people were thinking, you know, we should remember all this, but it's, it's true. We never knew any of those people. No. They, they, they all looked the same to me. The Russians yeah. and the Czechs. And, 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 you know, the one thing is very few of them stood out. I mean, they were all very good players. And they're yeah. so entrenched in playing this, the team game that there were very few individual uh, players that stood out. Yeah, exactly. And when, when Peter Stoshny come over here to play, and I think had more freedom to use his skills, he was as good as any centerman who ever played. Right. He was just a fabulous player. Nasty bugger like his dad and his uncle. Stoshny, check Savard. Potman takes the jolt. Orjak out to Stoshny. Here's Kozar. In over the line. He's done. Kept in by Halupa. In behind the Team Canada goal goes Savard. Savard out ahead to his own blue line to Marcel Dion. Broken up, Peter Stashley. He's checked by Sittler. Sittler will try it now with Dion. Feeds a pass to Dion, and Gorjak's there to break it up. Eight minutes and 43 seconds remain. Well, you can see that even back then, late in the game, there's a lot more hooking and holding that was let go. <laughs> You know. And referees certainly don't want to be involved in. There it is. There it is. That's exactly what had been planned after the third period that you hang on to the puck and that somehow that uh, Zerulia, the goaltender, would find his way out of the net and give you an open net to look at. That play was one that Siddler had in his mind since after the end of the third period. Yeah. Big goal for. The team, big goal for Canada. Yeah. Now you look at Scotty Bowman out there on the ice, Alan Eagleson. Yeah. Yeah, the celebration after was terrific. Yeah. There's Carol Vadne, who was a defenseman, a great defenseman who didn't dress yeah. in that game. That's right. So 11.33 of sudden death overtime. Vashon was outstanding in that series. Yeah, he sure was. Lanny McDonald on the ice. That last goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty enigmatic guy, that Alan Eagleson. I was right there. And probably, probably as influential in the NHL and as anybody who's ever been it. Um, you know, he's the guy who started the Players Association and actually helped keep a lot of teams in business when, you know, when we're drawing 5,000 people in Pittsburgh and four or 5,000 in Detroit and stuff. Yeah, now, that goal by, uh, by Siddler is just an outstanding effort. Just, yeah. just a, a great effort. Because we won at the end, it all seemed like a storybook. You know, you're losing, and then you win, and then all of a sudden you win three in a row in Russia. Now, Daryl Sidler scored a great goal. You talk about individual efforts by Canadian players, and that was one. And cradling, cradling the puck, doing exactly what he had been, uh, I mean, all forwards knew about this going into the overtime. And it was a great series. For me, it was certainly... Uh, a real happy moment there. See, me and Bobby Orr. There's no, 
No finer feeling for a hockey player than after a game when they're playing your national anthem. Yeah. You, you can't describe the chills it gives you unless you've had it, had done that. And as we've said so many times, there's a lot of teams can sing the Canadian national anthem. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Cheevers, as mentioned earlier, that was Rick Martin with the blue jersey on. Rick Martin, you know real well, not uh, getting into uh, into that game either. Danny Garris, some of the other guys, the great talents that. But all three from Buffalo. Yeah. Pearl. That's right. That's Martin right. played together all the time. Danny Garris played with uh, Craig Ramsey and Don Luce, but another three players from the same team. Player of the game on each team with the Carling O'Keefe Awards. Now it was, it was one of those tournaments. I think uh, you know for a lot of reasons it would probably be hard to duplicate. I mean there were other series in '79 and '81 and '87 with you know the great goal by Mario Lemieux. And they're always exciting. They're always special. But obviously for for me, and I would assume uh, similar for you, that that series was. Really, a uh, an ultimate. We we had not won the Stanley Cup by then. You had already won two, but you know, how did you compare it? I always felt the Stanley Cup was was bigger than these types of tournaments, um, only because I think I spent my life playing hockey, trying to win the cup, and you've went through how many years of playing with the same guys committed to winning the cup uh, it's a much much bigger commitment to win the Stanley Cup than it is to win a short series like this what makes these so special is you're playing for your country look at these guys everybody knows those Henry Richard in the back or in the front Morris Richard the rocket coming in to make the presentation right there most valuable players how great is that oh in Montreal, talk about tradition of the game. I think I think Henry has more Stanley Cup rings than he has fingers. <laughs> he does, I think. He does have 11. <laughs> I think he has 11. Yeah. He's got 11 Stanley Cup. Talk about a winner, eh? The awards are in crafted stone carvings. And probably not easy too when you come to think of it. You show up as a younger brother of Morris Richard, the Rocket. Boy, you got to find your own way. And not a big man either. Yeah, no. He and played. He, he played his last game in 19, uh, 1973 74 season. That was my first year in the NHL, and I got to play against Henry. Mm -hmm. Different player than his brother. I played against yeah, uh, Henry for four or five years. Yeah. But what a hockey player! Skate, and, and even though he wasn't very big, he was really tough. And again, I. I, I Quite recall, this goaltender was not to be their number one goaltender. Yeah. He just came out and played so much really better, better and was a big factor in their getting into the finals. Zarella. Yeah. Happy go lucky, eh? Yeah. Big guy. Yeah, big happy. Smile, yeah. Yeah. Always had a big grin on his face whenever you saw him off the ice. Great shape. <laughs> <laughs> well. They didn't handle a puck much in those days. No, didn't need to leave the net, eh? <laughs> That's right. I got that four by six. That's all I got to patrol. Yeah. <laughs> that was very deserving. You know, Daryl went on, I guess it was a couple of years after that, to uh, scored 10 points in the one game. It still stands as an NHL record. Yeah, that's one you could say probably will never be broken. Six goals and four assists against the Boston Bruins. Now watch the play here. Now that's totally individual plays. He gets committed. He's got his head up. He sees Drulio make his move, and then that is wide open. At 11:33 of sudden death overtime, Daryl Sittler getting the winning goal as Team Canada wins the Canada Cup in two straight games, winning the best of three final with that five score tonight. Alan Eagleson and guess. I think hockey players of, of any era, Bobby, you can. Tell me what you feel, but are have so much in common. I mean, playing the game for your country, just playing the game has always been the most the most important thing, the number one thing. And I think you you know now that uh, when you walk in the locker room, today's players, although the game is different and they may be better conditioned, but 
the mentality of the player today is exactly the same as it was my, through my era. And I played with guys who were 15 years older than me, but their attitude is the same as mine. That part of the game has never changed. Thank heavens. It's a great sport to play. It's a team sport that allows you to to be an individual at times and to do some fantastic individual things like like we just saw Sidler do. And there's Milan over. You were talking about a lot earlier. One great hockey player. He was I mean, the for the checks, but he couldn't play in the NHL. Right. That's exactly right. I think you know who it is. Rogacien Vachon. <laughs> Rogi played. Uh, I remember, I, of course, I wasn't in the NHL then, but he, he came up as a rookie in the playoffs for the Montreal Canadiens, if I'm correct. And then went on to have a brilliant career and still uh, in Los Angeles, in some way affiliated with the Los Angeles Kings, but a French Canadian and. He they managed love. the Kings for a long time, Rogi. Really yeah. good. Really, really good guy. And flag waving in a very happy Team Canada tonight. <laughs> Peter now. It was great. You know, I, I, I got to mention about the, the camaraderie between the guys on the team. And you remember after practices, everybody would go together, you know, and have lunch. You know, they they didn't have to, they didn't have a lunch prepared for us or, or breakfasts or anything. Uh, you know, you would say, you know, invite all the guys. We go to a local pub and, you know, or a restaurant and have lunch. Everybody showed up. It was, uh, we got to be very tight very quickly. Yes. I remember going to Peter Mahovlich's house and visiting with his family uh, during that time. Yeah, those memories last you a lifetime. Bobby Clark comes to accept the majestic mink fur hat. They'll be presented to all members of Team Canada. Well, I kind of wish I was about 30 years younger right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get back into it. How many times did you say that? Couldn't we do yeah. it just once more? So that's uh, that's what we were talking about earlier, the uh, the exchange of jerseys. See, I got Milan Novi's jerseys right there. It was caught on uh, the tape. Coming up, of course, and we did the same thing uh, with the Russians. The yeah. National news delayed, of course, because of the length and the overtime of this hockey game. And, a very and uh, game I wonder if they've kept our jerseys. I wonder if they have the Czechoslovakian eBay <laughs> going over there for the Bobby Clark jersey, <laughs> 76 Canada Cup. <laughs> You're not going to wear that, are you? I don't know. <laughs> They must have told without me to put your it teeth. on. <laughs> uh, I could make a fool of myself without trying. I didn't. <laughs> they must have told me to put it on. Well, there's a great picture of you uh, sort of on the ice. I don't know if you're smiling or grinning, but you don't have those front teeth, and it kind of epitomizes Canadian hockey, you know? You know, you just... Yeah, long before the helmets and the masks yeah, and the mouth guards. Long and, hair and uh, yeah. you know, a couple of teeth missing. and Very common. A real solid sort of intense grin or look on your face. And I tell you, they won a lot of fans here in Canada and around the world. They played an exciting... Now, of course, these are all the Czech players wearing, <laughs> wearing our jerseys. And yeah. the oil painting for the outstanding Canadian player... Checks thanking the fans. Yeah, I tell you, the fans are really a nice response to them. I guess it was a great uh, education for all the fans in, in Canada as well to see the talent of these teams. I think... I mean, nobody had seen these guys before. No, nobody. no. And we had never seen uh, hockey teams thanking the fans, but what a great, a great thing to do after a series like that. And Don Cherry, God, how could we forget to mention Don Cherry? He was a member of the coaching staff back then. I don't remember him being quite so boisterous <laughs> back in uh, 1976. They kept the microphone away from him. Right. <laughs> I played with his brother, Dick, in Philadelphia. Dick was a better player than Don. Dick played in the NHL. Don spent most of his career in the minors, but mm. obviously Don became a great coach, and Dick went back and was a principal in a high school. Yeah. 
Look at that, rookie. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you see this game. It, it's obviously quite a, quite a evident that Rogi was outstanding throughout the tournament. And as I said, uh, you know, don't know that a lot of people thought that he was going to be the number one goaltender, but I think right from the exhibition games that we played early on that uh, he wanted it and he became uh, solid throughout the series. Jerry Cheevers certainly there to back up. In the last... Uh 29 years, there's been a lot of great Canadian players have had the same feeling that we had there. Yeah. So many Canadian teams that continue year after year to win at every level, carrying the pride of the country no matter what age you are. Well, you're right. It's hard to compare to the Stanley Cup. We both have a chance to win uh, win both, you know, Olympic Series or International Series and the Stanley Cup. And I think the, the defining matter is that we spent seven or eight years trying to win a Stanley Cup with the same guys. You know, and you're right, a short series, it is great to to be with your, you know, the team that we put together a month before and you win, but it doesn't compare for me anyway as a Canadian to winning the Stanley Cup, something I dreamed about. I remember the first time I, I sort of held it up, I all I could think of was Jean Beliveau, my hero, you know, skating around the Montreal Forum with the Stanley Cup. I'm sure your visions were your own as well, but they all came back from the childhood, you know, that we had in hockey in Canada. And I, I, I don't see that changing from Canadian kids. No. When you talk to them, they come to us now at 18, 19 years old, and you talk to them, it's just win the Stanley Cup. It's like you're born with that dream, and nobody can understand, and, and myself included, can't understand why I loved playing hockey. It hurt. My dad yeah. wasn't an athlete, and I just couldn't get enough of the ice, and you obviously were the same, and the yeah. kids are the same today. All these kids, every, from everywhere across Canada, they just, yeah. it's you just so great. You know, it's a good point. I, you don't know where it comes from. I mean, uh, my kids are not, you know, athletes. Uh, you know, you, then you get a you get a Gordie Howe with two sons at play, and obviously Mark, a tremendous player in the National Hockey League, and Marty played very well for a long time as well. You just don't know where it comes from. And it's interesting to watch a lot of the Europeans where a lot of the fathers and sons did follow in their footsteps. Yeah, exactly. Now, certainly we have many of our own here too, obviously. Uh, There's Brett, a great tool, Blake. Brett Hull. There's Bobby Crom right there. Yeah, great toe, Blake. <laughs> I guess Don Cherry decided that he was going to have those big, thick collars early. Look at that. He's the only one with a tie-off. That group was pretty, probably the, yeah. the best hockey brains in the world at that time, or at least in North America. I, I think McNeil. there's probably yeah. others like Al Arbor and Bill Torrey and some of the others could have been part of it, but... I don't know how you could get a better group who had more knowledge of players and more knowledge of hockey. Yeah, you know, well, Keith Allen in the background Keith as well. Allen, yeah. Keith Allen, Sam Pollock. Well, when, when we talk about guys like uh, Danny Gare and, you know, and Richard Martin on the sidelines, uh, these, these, this coaching staff had some tough decisions to make as to who was going to dress on any given night and who was going to be kept mm -hmm. after training camp. Yeah. Tough decisions. Uh, they have the tough decisions to make, and the only way that they're right is if you win. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so they were right. Quite a hero in Canada. Quite yes. a hero in Canada himself at that time, wasn't he? Yes. Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He met us in Montreal in a rainstorm uh, after '72. Uh, what a! Uh, and I only got to talk to him briefly a couple of times. What a neat guy to talk to. Yeah. Yeah, I remember after this uh, the, this victory, we went back to their house in Ottawa, I guess, uh, the Prime Minister's mansion, and had a big celebration for us a few days later. Shoulder pads there are a little different from the ones they were today. <laughs> so is the upper body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no kidding. But look at that. You barely wore the shoulder pads, just yeah. barely wear them. I mean, Guys would, would just put the epaulets on at times. Everybody's happy. Everybody's having fun. What was your weight at that time? When, uh, About 185. You know, uh, you look back at 1976, and you look at that uh, that defense, and Bobby Orr played at almost 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in the 210, 212 category, and Serge Savard was 6'4", probably 215. Larry was in the same size, 6'4", 215. Gila Point right there was also... 205, 210. Pretty big guys on defense when you consider 
you know, 1976, almost 30 years ago. Yeah. And, and in that era, you guys were huge, huge players and all very mobile. It's interesting, Dennis, over the years, I've traveled in Czechoslovakia and Russia and so many countries, and you meet the old players that I played against and played in the 70s and early 80s that are now, you know, their grandfathers and stuff like I am. They may speak a different language, have from a, come from a different culture, but hockey players are hockey players no matter where they are in the world. It's wonderful. And I think it's an honor to our trade because I don't care if a hockey player becomes a lawyer, a doctor, or a prime minister. He'll always be known as a hockey player first, and, and it's a very honorable job to have. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Bob. This is great reminiscing with you. It sure has been. Thank 1976 you. Canada Cup. Uh, we could do that again pretty soon. I wouldn't <laughs> mind. Oh, wouldn't that be something, eh? This is Canada Cup 76 on CTV.